last month, in last month's session, we began with some introductory remarks and we entered the first topic of the hidden awareness or the hidden consciousness of cosmic connection. Today's session will have two parts. First, it will focus on the cultural consciousness of the community. And the second part will be the consciousness of the sacred and the obedience to the will of the community. At the end of this first part, we will have a 10 minute break, after which we will go into the second topic, what Javier has just mentioned. We ask you to please prepare and keep your questions or your comments until the last 15 minutes, because there we will have some time in order to share our questions, comments before closing. So we would like to point out that our work in these sessions focuses on the experiences lived between the 60s and the 80s. However, we are aware of the things that are currently happening in Chiapas. We are very much aware of that and we are very much concerned about it. So this is just a reflection on the current status of things. We are aware of the context of violence that has been gradually escalating in the state of Chiapas. With this, the presence of new armed actors, the development of state policies and territorial dynamics, which require a greater plural and multidisciplinary analysis. So the important issues to understand today are the role of the state, the community impacts, the strategies against militarization and militarism, the analysis of the macro criminal networks, the degree of collusion between private and public actors, collective and community protection, and the mechanisms and the strategies for peace building. In these sessions, these issues will be elements of reflection that will challenge us, that will question us about the need to delve, to go deeper into the ancestral force of the peoples and their struggles so that it can illuminate their search for a sustainable future. Now we would like to start, I mean, we are going to do this in every session by calling the snail. It's a sacred call for the snail. I mean, we did this last time as well, and we want to do it again because it calls all of us as it does call the communities in Chiapas whenever there is a special occasion. So, let's begin by remembering some of the key concepts that we presented in the last session. Our mission is to learn in order to facilitate the transformation of our consciousness. Our main goal is to share what we've learned in order to return those learnings to the communities, especially 
iniciativas en los jóvenes. To create new initiatives in the young generations. We acknowledge that we are facing a possible civilization collapse within a few decades if we do not move unitedly and quickly in order to change our predatory and destructive relationship with the earth that actually sustains us. We urgently need to develop and embrace a new ethical, cultural, inclusive, and ecosystemic paradigm that allows us to enter into more empathic y el buen vivir a beneficio de todas las esferas de existencia de nuestro planeta. <coughs> la emergencia de la conciencia oculta de la conexión cósmica que vimos el, en la sesión anterior nos revela que quien posee tu tiempo posee tu mente. Adueñate de tu tiempo y serás dueño de tu propia mente. Al adentrarnos al sol king de las 13 lunas y los 20 sellos de los mayas, nos orienta hacia un potencial de vivir en armonía con el universo. El sol king es un modelo fractal de energía que es esencialmente un guía espiritual que nos permite ubicarnos en relación al todo, encontrando sentido para nuestras vidas. Kunafku es origen de la vida más allá del sol. It's the origin of life beyond the sun. Y de la medida. It gives movement and measure. Del propósito. It's a galactic nucleus core of purpose and the activity of being. The movement corresponds to energy, to the consciousness of everything. Measure means the beginning of the rhythm. And form. It is from this cosmovision that we will enter the notion of community. Now, our first topic is the cultural awareness of the community. Our journey requires that we give ourselves permission to walk on a perceptive path from another culture. We are going to integrate a vision that enables us to understand, to feel, and to explore a non-Western worldview that leads us down a broad avenue of civilization. This is the Mayan culture. In order to enter this dimension, we will open up the pages of the Popol Vuh. Popol Vuh means the book of the community. Today, we will focus on this book. This means the book of the community. This book was written in the year 1550 by an indigenous man who, after learning to write with Latin characters, he captured and wrote down the oral account of an old man. Currently, the original manuscript is in the Newberry Library of Chicago. The Popol Vuh reflects a Mayan worldview and philosophy, which describes in epic events the achievements of a growing consciousness with actions and with bonds of unity towards greater concentrations of psychic energy that is transformative. The Mayan cosmology in the Popol Vuh tells us how community has been built through a long intentional process from the very beginning. This process overcomes difficulties and struggles between good and evil and has a fate of unity due to the vital connection between all beings, the sun, the stars, the moon, the earth, the plants, the water, air, fire and human beings 
and animals all interact as participants and as actors that contribute to the advancement to forwarding consciousness, awareness, and therefore to the creation of community. Now we will watch a video about the Popol Vuh. This is a story about creation. This is a story about creation, the beginning, when everything was stillness, was silence and water. There was no light, no land, plants, human beings or animals. Six deities, cubiertas in plumas. Six De deities, gods covered in green and blue feathers, rested in the primordial waters. The creator and former Tepeu, and the and the feathered serpent, along with Yapakok and Yatsumane. These gods help the heart of heaven or hurricane to create the earth. The essence of their spirits and miraculous powers gave the earth its creative energy. Now the earth had a heart, and they called it the heart of the earth. The deities joined their words and their thoughts and came to an agreement, and thus the creation arose. Now everything was fed by the heart of heaven and the heart of earth. To separate the sky from the earth, they planted a seba. The roots penetrated deep into the nine levels of the Mayan underworld. The trunk remained on the surface of the earth and the branches reached the 13 levels of the Mayan overworld or superworld. Later, plants were created to live on the land. Then animals were created, but the animals did not know how to worship. So the gods decided to create humans made of mud but these humans did not have souls, nor were they good day keepers. They were destroyed in a great flood. The gods again tried and they created humans made of wood, but the wood humans couldn't worship them either. So they destroyed them. Those of them who survived are said to have become the monkeys on the trees. Now, the gods created the last form of human beings using maize. Maize is a precious substance that ultimately produced long-lasting and true humans. Fulfilling the designs, two twins were born, Hunaku and Shpalanke, whose grandmother recognized them as magical and wonderful. The twins descended into the underworld and there surviving very difficult tests, they managed to overcome evil, disease and death. They acted together always and with the support and the knowledge and cunning of animals, plants, water and wind. Later, they saw the mouse and they decided to capture it. When the mouse was captured, he told them, remember the heritage of your father, of your parents, when they went to play ball in Shibalba. They were very surprised. And the mouse said, you are ball players. The twins were happy and they were thrilled to know that they were ball players. Later, at the top of the beam, the mouse began to gnaw and gnaw until the ball and all the equipment fell into the hands of the twins. They started to play and the lords of the underworld heard sounds of people playing ball. They wanted then a ball for themselves. So the lords of the underworld 
wanted, wanting to talk to the brothers, did so through their grandmother, and they asked her to send them a message. The grandmother then found a louse and asked him to carry the message. The louse found a toad, a frog, sorry, who said, I'll help you. And suddenly the frog met the snake who told him, I will help you. And the snake ate the frog. Then she was carried away by an eagle and flying the eagle came to the ball court where the brothers were. We bring a message. This is, you, your grandmother says that you should show up in seven days for a ball game. Kunambu and Malanke, before they left, they went to comfort and they say goodbye to their grandmother. And they said, each one of us will plant a cane of maize in front of our house. If it dries up, it will be the sign that we have died. But if they sprout, they, it will be a sign that we are alive. Several days, seven days had already passed since they were going through the canyons among scorpions and other dangerous animals. Arriving at the river of blood and pus, the inhabitants of the underworld thought that the twins would be destroyed, but they did not touch the deadly waters. And instead they slipped, they went on their blowguns. While on the way they reached the crossroads called Cuatro Caminos, Four Paths, and they did not hesitate. And in order to know where to go, which way to go, they sent an insect and they told it, sting one by one and learn the names of everybody. And your reward will be for all eternity that you suck the blood of these people. The twins upon arrival greeted each one of the lords and named them by their names because the mosquito had already told them that if they named everybody by their name, it would nullify the power of the evil. At this moment, the gentleman said, go to the house of darkness and that will be the first test of Sibalba. They were told, light your ocotes and your, cigar and your cigars and keep them burning all night, but you must return them intact in the morning. The twins inserted fireflies into the tips of each cigars and macaw feathers in the tips of their torches. And the next morning, the brothers handed over their cigars and their torches intact. The evil lords or lords of evil told them, we will play ball. And they began to do so with people's skulls from which obsidian stone came out. Seeing that, the brothers said, you want to kill us? The lords of the underworld said, let's play again. But this time with your ball. And when playing with the twins ball, the ball was able to go through the ring and at that moment, they won. Two old men appeared in Sibalba and they only danced. They danced like the armadillo, like the owl, and like the centipede. And all of the subterranean world, the underworld admired them. And they saw that they beheaded themselves and came back to life. The lords of Sibalba told them, now sacrifice my dog and bring it back to life. And they said, sacrifice this man and tear each other to pieces now. Kunapu and Shmalanke performed so well that they made the gentlemen feel as if they were performing music. That is when the lords of Shibalba got excited and wanted to be part of this party. And they said, sacrifice us and then bring us back to life. And that was how Hunbanku and Shmalanke sacrificed them and they did not bring them back to life. Then they showed who they were. They revealed who they were and they said, we are Hunbanku and Shmalanke and you, are the ones who killed our parents. 
you will never be powerful again. They headed up into the sky and one became the sun and the other became the moon. Together, they light up the sky and the earth. Together, they light up the sky and the earth. Descifrando este okay, popol wood. so deciphering this popol wood. Popol wood tells, narrates enormous difficulties that reach the limit between life and death and which are overcome by unity, by solidarity and by complementarity. For example, they give actors superior powers to transcend and to achieve new dimensions of life, such as being able to see, to sail or when the serpent and the frog and the eagle were accomplices in order to send the message to the grandmother or when the mosquito guides them to find their road ahead or in order to domain, to prevail over the masters of Shibalba. That implies the transformation towards new states that are seen, for example, when they can die and go back to life. It also implies that there is a new meaning, a new belief, such as, for example, when Hunapu and Ishpalanke declare their identity, defeating sickness, defeating death and evilness. And it grants new lights and mental or spiritual instruments, such as when at the end, the twins become the sun and the moon in order to shed light on life. Inspired by the original force and learning from the experiences, there are new states of consciousness that open up. That is to say, there are advances in evolution. It is the entire community of the universe which is moving towards its own unity and wholeness. The Popol Vuh is the book of the community and it's a book of millennial achievements. Having come into this world of the Popol Vuh, now we have the possibility of going into a new dimension of this Mayan understanding that is called the Tulel world. The understanding that the community is made up of everyone is something that will help us understand or get to know how this keyword Tulel works within each one of us. It has a sound quite explosive, you know, Tulel. So the Tulel concept is an essential element in the Mayan cosmogony, the Tzetal and Tzotzil cosmogony, because it explains the way in which we can perceive ourselves and themselves in the world. Tulel is the key that integrates our being, our existence, our belonging, our bond in different aspects of life, such as could be health, sickness, relationship with others, authority, gender, kingship, conflicts. So it implies the whole of our lives. Relevantly, Chulel relates to language and to its value and meaning. It is lived with practices and with rituals that provide movement and meaning to life and to the communities. Chulel is an essential term, an essential word in the Tzetzal and Tzotzil languages. In order to understand this term, we will try to unravel its interpretation from the understanding of the people itself. I mean, the Tzetzal and Tzotzil people from their own language and their own philosophy. There is a linguist called Elena Lunes. She collected this vision of Tulen by 
calling it the Tulel world, as if it were a concept that tries to find wholeness of elements, both the tangible and the intangible conceptions, which make up the person and the society. So let's have a look. The Mayan etymology of this word, of this word in Tetzal and Tzotzil, it has the root that is tool, and it is translated as sacred. And then the suffix lel means what it is or which is. It's a way in Spanish um, to try to explain, to, to put it into um, logical words, but it's that suffix implies what it is. So what is sacred and sacred, sacred it is. So for example, in the word tulna, it's sacred house. So the sense is kind of more a, a place of prayer or a sacred house for the whole of the community. When you say tul ten, it means sacred cave. So it is a cave, a place where you do sacred things and you venerate the energy. Tul ha means sacred water. So a place where the water, the source of life is. Tul tan is the sacred serpent, or it's actually the designation of the sky as the firmament above us. According to Mario Ruz, an indigenous top seal, he says that Tulel is the vital principle, the principle of unity, diversity, totality. All beings have a Tulel. The Tulel has a value. So we can have several Tulels that live within us. The ideal is to have the 13 Tulels so remember that we were talking in the first session, in the previous session, about the 13 moons and their vibrations. So Tulel is vital energy. So it's an interpretation of someone else, another person that is very important in the anthropology, in the anthropology studies. He's called Robert Holland. What he says is that Tulel I mean, taken from the interpretation of the indigenous people themselves, implies vital energy. It is the spirit. It is um, a life-giving or an indestructible dynamic that manifests itself in our bodies, in our actions, in our ideas or relations, or even the powers that we have. Tulel also makes reference to the numinous world, that is to say, part of the magical, the invisible, the sacred world. It comes from the mind, uh, from individual and community experiences. So this wide and deep dimension can only be treated sometimes by the hilolytic, that is to say, the hilolytic are the people who can actually deep look deeply, analyze deeply what is happening. They are the healers. And this concept is um, was established by Jacinto Arias, an indigenous Tzotzil, who is also an anthropologist. And talking about anthropologists, there is another one called Miguel Sanchez. He says that Tulel is consciousness. He says it is a um, psychic element related to the totality and linked to the social, social and cultural aspects. So let's have a look now at this image, Tulel. So let's analyze Tulel as a whole, because we have already said that it's, that it is consciousness we said that it represents consciousness, that it also represents the sacred dimension of our being, that it is the divine and magic powers, that it is also the vital energy or the spirit that we have. And it is a vital principle. So these elements, all these elements, 
are the ones that can give us a vision and understanding that whenever we talk about the word tulel, it encompasses all these dimensions. So imagine that tulel implies consciousness, that it implies uh, the sacred, the power, the energy, the principle, the vital principle. All beings have tulel, whether you are a human being, an animal, a plant, a star, an insect, the sun, the moon, the air, the stones, the mountains. So our tulel is our consciousness. It is the vital movement, it is the energy, it is the spirit, the magic. It is our sacred being in motion. The following melody that we are going to sing was created in an assembly of catechists and two neles of the community of Tani Perlas in the Lacandona jungle. As a result, of a reflection that was being conducted there in order to express the discovery of their own culture and their own traditions. So now we are going to interpret this, to sing this, and you can listen to us. It's in the Tseltal language. And as Katy said, as Katy said, it was conducted, it was created in Tani Perlas, in the Tani Perlas community. This community included 20, 30 sub-communities. The translation into English is this, life lives within us, it is the spirit of our consciousness, it's sent to be within us, it moves in us through our culture, let us rejoice with all our hearts. We are looking for our freedom with the entire universe. Having explored the Chulel world, we are now going to enter the community from the understanding of its word. The word is the essence of community, the word of the community. When we talk about community, let us first tell you a story, a story that happened to our friend, our colleague, Carlos, Dr. Carlos Lengersdorf, but he was our friend Carlos. Carlos was a German man who, along with his wife, Gundruff, they lived and they worked for almost 20 years with the Tojo Laval communities in Chiapas, with the 
Diocese of San Cristóbal and his bishop, Don Samuel Ruiz. One day, Carlos arrived at the community of Lomantan and approaching his friend Juan, he said, I want to ask a favor of you. Can you be my teacher? Can you teach me the Toholabal language? Juan was very surprised and he answered, hey, Carlos, a lot of people come here and they all come as teachers to teach us. They teach us to read, they teach us to write, they teach us Spanish, they teach us about health, agriculture, religion, taking care of the water, of water and many other things. Until now, no one has ever asked us to be their teachers. And even less have we been asked to teach Tojolabal. You are the first person to ask us this. This makes me think that you see that our language is valuable and that you care and that you are interested in it. For me, this is very important. Juan kept talking and he said, in order to respond to your request, I first need to discuss it with the community. And that's where the answer will come from. This was a memorable event. And it was a valuable moment, both for Carlos and for Juan. Carlos realized that he had sparked something very important in the heart of Juan and his community, generating appreciation, enormous appreciation for his own language. For Juan, it was remarkable to see that someone from the outside of the community actually valued and wanted to understand his Tojolabal language and culture. The language is the essence of the richness of a culture, and the appreciation of this language reflects an esteem, an appreciation towards the community. This is the meaning of our languages. Appreciation and the esteem towards the community. The Celtal and Tzotzil Mayans, when they speak about their own languages, they call them Bachtzil Kop, which means the true word. This means that the person and the community speak and respond to each other from within themselves, looking for coherence between what they think, what they say, and what they do, and responding aligned with their consciousness and with the spirit that reflects their true selves. In the Tzertal and Tzotzil Mayan languages, the word is called kop. This concept itself means word. However, it is a polysemic term. It is formed with prefixes and suffixes. And contextualized or in context, it can have many different meanings. So now we would like to tell you about the surprise that Carlos Lenkenhoff encountered when he learned the Tojolabal language, he discovered that the meaning of the of the Tojolabal language, because of its etymology, means the true listeners. That is impressive. True listeners. Reflecting in both mind and heart, Carlos remembered and he commented, in Europe, we do not know how to listen. We don't listen. Each person has their own monologue with a huge background of isolated self-dialogues dialogues that never meet others because they live and believe in individualized and isolated lives. Carlos was aware that he had entered a linguist, a Toholabal Mayan linguistic dynamic, the essence of which is the word that is listened to. The listen to word becomes fertile for the contribution, approval, and unity with others. That is, 
for and because of the community. I think that now it's a good idea to ask ourselves, to ask the people, those of us who are outsiders, how many ideas, methods, proposals have we imposed on indigenous peoples, both uh, uh, socially, culturally, economically, religiously, and politically, without really having understood nor their language, their meanings, and even less the dynamics that govern them. How many realities, how many truths have been have remained hidden because we do not understand the meaning of people's contributions, their quests, their desires. We would like to tell you now another story, another anecdote, which is quite funny. It has to do with an event that was held in 1966 in San Cristóbal de las Casas in order to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the death of Fray Bartolomé de las Casas. There was a choir made up of indigenous Tetzal and Sotzil youth under the under the direction of a teacher who did not understand the languages of Chiapas. They had to sing a text that said in Celtal, Las Casas, Lek Awotan Kushulat Taxpactel Kinal, which translated as Las Casas, you have a big heart and you live on forever among us. The teacher who directed the choir said with emphasis the word mushuk instead of kushul. The young people of the community laughed so hard that they could hardly sing because what the teacher was saying translated as las casas, you are huge navel or belly button, you will live forever among us. The things that can change because you don't understand a language of a community, you can mix up and create this type of situations. So to be true listeners is to have the ability to pay attention to the other, to pay attention to their words, their vibrations, to give feedback, to feedback from each other, to construct, to build with others while we have a dialogue and not to remain in these monologues, as Carlos said. Our Western culture always says, follow the three steps to do this, follow the seven steps to do that other thing. They, we all have formulas. What we think is that knowing, being true listeners of the Tojolabales gives us the key to be, to understand the Tojolabales, that is to pay careful attention to the words of others, to repeat what the other person says so as they, so as that person knows that he's being listened to, and also generate question based on the interests of the community, distinguish consensus and dissent, in order to move forward the dialogue until we generate mutual lessons learned and mutual agreements. Carlos said, listening to learning, sorry, to listen integrates two different attitudes to stop understanding the word as property of the person who speaks on the one hand, and on the other, listening with the heart in order to receive the words of the others and build the us. This construction is based on the premise that everything has a heart. The earth is a living organism, and human beings are part of a unity that does not differentiate between what is living and what is non-living. We are a totality, we are a whole. When studying the community, it is very important to delve into the concept of the multiple meanings of the word heart. For the Tetzal Mayan culture, the heart is the center from which it, everything is spoken and it is understood from and with the interior. The expression kotan in Celtal has two elements comes from its etymology again. Otan is the heart or the core 
it means heart and with the prefix k means i together k otan translates into my heart although the essence of this word is i heart because it's not a possession it is who you are it is i heart also when someone acts in a bad way in relation to the heart it can be said that it can be said chai yotan which means his or her heart is lost the heart of this person is lost is out of place if someone deliberately lies it is said to this person cheb yotan two hearts cheb means two yotan heart which is impossible and illogical nobody can have two hearts but this is said deliberately chepiotan meaning double there is a lie in your heart saying this phrase points to the inconsistency that one can have with oneself and with the others on the contrary Feelings of joy and satisfaction and happiness are also expressed when we speak of the heart. Lom lek kotantik, where lom means a lot, lek means what is good, kotantik, our hearts. This is to say a lot of joy within our hearts. Thus, when speaking of the community, the community also expresses its feelings with its heart when a community wants to express the best of its states of fair and productive relationships it says hunash kotantik ayotik which means we are united in one single heart hunash means a single one kotantik mine or our heart and ayotik we are to say that we are united in a single heart means to be in the best possible state of being. For example, in the Indigenous Congress conference celebrated in 1974, approximately with between all the communities, over 300,000 indigenous people participated. There were Celtal, Sotzil, Tocolabales, and Chols. They participated, preparing for a year. They elected 1,500 representatives from all the communities. And they got together. They recognized that they were in one single heart. And the way that they had to express their enormous joy was by singing the anthem of the Indigenous Conference that was sung in the four languages. In Solcil, Tojolabal, Tetzal, and Chol. We're going to sing it only in one language. We're going to sing it in the Celtal language. Celtal, Sotzil, Tojolabal, Chol. Celtal, Sotzil, Tojolabal, Chol. Kunash, Kotan, Yashbenoti. Kunash, Kotan, Yashkoloti. Sok, Tasti, Tilbunanotak. Sok, Tasti, In one heart, we walk. In one heart, we cannot be released together with all our sisters and brothers, together with the whole universe. Okay, so now let's go into the second topic for today, which is the awareness of the obedience to the community mandate. When we talk about obedience to the community mandate, it is important to understand where it comes from and how that mandate originates, what, is, what its principle is. The community us 
is the origin of the mandate. In the community of Avellanal, the municipality of Ocosingo, Chiapas, faced with a difficult situation that required a decision, a community assembly was held in 1967. In that assembly, the president of the Egidal Commission declared, brothers and sisters, all of us, the community members, we are all the authority. So everyone answered, yes, yes, that's right. The us, we, is the ultimately, is the ultimate instance. It's the authority of the community mandate as well as of the community power. So the understanding of this us or we is important. It's important to be understood. Knowledge of the language is an unavoidable condition for coexistence because it allows us to go closer to the understanding of the Mayan world about the communities. When we were working in Chiapas, various participants of the dioceses, as well as other professionals or teachers, or even some other people who lived there with the communities, they did not seem it was relevant to learn or even to understand their languages, the languages of the people, brothers or sisters, totsils, that's all that they lived with. Some saw it in a practical way saying, okay, we can talk to them, but why do we need to learn their language if I can talk to them in my own language? And I mean, there's nothing more important than that. I mean, I can teach them that. And other people, but even we're a more pejorative sense, enemies, I could call them, said, but how come? I mean, and they have this racist and discriminatory connotation. They said, but how come? How are we supposed to be learning this language, the dialect of Indians? These people had no notion, no awareness of what we were talking about. Um, by studying the languages, little by little, we can go deeper and we can acquire, we did acquire, as a matter of fact, a deeper and more structured understanding. And that's why we are better able to understand the meanings, kind of knowing how to read, how to interpret their world, as well as their relationships. And that's what we would like to share with you today. So for the Mayan culture, the relation between the I and the we, there is a superior and wide prevalence of the us or the we. So when they express themselves from the we, they are uniting the relationship between the I and the we. Because they start from the principle that they are subjects speaking to one another, not objects, but subjects. And that's why the dialogue of subjects creates a, an awareness of the we. This we, this we implies a link as well, a link between the community and the animals, or oh, the sun and the moon, and with all the energy of nature, which is there in their environment. I would like to tell you that on one occasion, I was coming, I was going down a, a road, a path, and there I met Sebastian, Sebastian Hernández Mesa. He was the president of the Indigenous Congress in Cetal de Tenejapa. So I said, hello, my brother, Sebastian, how are you? Of course, speaking his language, I was speaking his language. Where are you coming from? And he answered what in Spanish or English would be, I come from our milpa. Uh, and what he meant was his work plot. Milpa would be like a cornfield plot. And so it caught my attention. What was he telling me? Why did he say from our cornfield, from our milpa? So the sense is that it was their milpa, their farmland, their plot. 
So because it doesn't belong to one, to himself in this case, the farmland or the plot belonged to everyone, to the community. Same thing happens with the water, the air, or all the nature, all the ecosystem that surrounds them. It belongs to everyone. The land belongs to everyone. And therefore, the community belongs to everyone as well. This understanding is very powerful because that we or our is the essence of the relation that they have with the whole. A very important example was the reaction of a community to a crime committed by some young people who stole something in a nearby community. When the authorities of their community where these young people belong to, when they heard about this event, they went to visit and to speak with the assembly of the, the, assembly of the other community. And they said, we come on behalf of our brothers because they committed a crime and it is our responsibility to take care of all the people in our community. So we bring here the payment of what they stole in order to give it to you. We came here because it's very important that we may ask for forgiveness and that we may be fair to your community. The community that had been affected received the money that was brought to them. The authorities then returned to their own community and told the young people who had uh, stole. Brothers, you are our community. And that is why we went to pay for what you stole. You are our brothers. Although you did not represent us correctly before the other community at that particular time, at least. So you will have to work here in this community in order to be able to recover what the community gave so that you could stay free. That was the agreement that the community had decided on and the young people fulfilled it. Therefore, the community, by means of its authorities, wisely focused its actions, not on condemnation, not on exclusion or punishment, but on restoring justice, on teaching these young people about their dignity as members of a community that does take care and seeks to educate its members, especially the young members. There is a community unity that exists, but unfortunately, it is being violated since the constitutional changes on land tenure made by Carlos Salinas de Gortari, the president, in 1991. The agrarian reform law under the presidency of Lázaro Cárdenas in 1936 was the result of the Mexican Revolution since 1910 to 1917. Yeah, 1910 to 1917, yes. Because that law responded to the cry of the land and freedom that was what the people was crying out at that time. Lázaro Cárdenas endowed the indigenous peoples and the peasants with land through a system, through an edgido system, that is to say a community system. And there was these community possessions or belongings and the land was not, could not be inherited. It could not be sold either with the constitutional changes made by Salinas de Gortari, now the land can be sold and it is actually sold. This change has broken the community spirit and the legal possession of land, beginning to break up the unity that had been the main link of this community with their land. The indigenous communities, despite the brutal attack of individualism against this sense of collectivity have kept their own systems of government. 
and their philosophy prevails, manifested or shown in their customs. The sense that the land belongs to them, like to the whole community, and that they belong to the land as well, it still prevails. The belief that we are a unity with earth, with the water, with the animals, nature, that prevails as well, and that we are linked and we need each other. The struggle continues, the debate continues to enforce this guiding force of the community over individualism. They affirm themselves as a Mayan culture, saying that individuals are valuable in the community environment, where every person has recognition, acknowledgement, belonging, and freedom to be part of the community that protects them and that includes them as part of itself. The agreement as a system of community unity. It is by means of this social agreement of social system of an agreement that the communities can decide this agreement operates through the reflection and the participation of the entire community. In the assembly, certain situations or, or certain needs to be solved arise. And then people listen to them, people consider, value, discuss them, and then openly they make a decision. And this decision is what they call the agreement. The agreement is the guide of what is going to be done with executive indications of how and when it is going to be carried out. The agreement requires the consensus, consensus of everyone. They give themselves enough time to listen to each other, to provide feedback to each other, and gradually, they can build consensus. We saw once um, how they discussed an issue that they thought was difficult. I mean, it was not something legal or something internal about their understandings or their values. And we can tell you that they spent all night discussing until they finally uh, found an agreement because there was a lack of agreement during that time. And overnight, I mean, in the morning, they say, we've reached an agreement. So this interaction was the important part. And it creates trust, empathy, respect, so that the arguments can become a unity in terms of thought and heart. So the agreement is not owning anyone else. It, it means the strength and the value of the whole community. People acknowledge it as ours and respect it as a norm, as a guide, in order to comply with it, with work and cooperation. As a matter of fact, the structural difference of the agreement as the Zetal and Sotzil Mayan system is based on the fact that the community is the unity of the us, of the we. Therefore, the voice and the decision of every person is valuable because of its contributions, because of what they wish, what they say. So the agreement is not made by a majority vote, but it is established by the convergence of consensus. So it's not a question of time, how long it will take. The question is reaching consensus. Athletic are the communal authorities. Of work in terms of the selection or election of authorities between Zetzal Totzil and the they name them the Atletic, which means workers. Indeed, authorities are considered workers of the community and for the community. Authority comes not from an external law, but by an internal, endogenous, and ancestral value that the community itself creates in its assembly. This is why the community, we or us, is who appoints the athletic. 
This we is the authority par excellence to govern the community. The athletic are people who perform functions in, in the community. The work of governing, of government, is carried out with community control. And therefore, those who govern, they exercise their position temporarily for the community. For example, in a religious field, deacons are called tu neletik, which means servers. Tuun is the person who serves. Eletik is a generic. These are the servants of the community. The we represents actually the organizing principle of social, social political relationships. These relationships need to be understood horizontally. In the Tetzal language, we call it pahalotik, which means we are all equal, men and women, we are all equal. There are different authorities. There are catechists, municipal agents, presidents of the Hermitage, commissioners. There are also commissions, projects for women who prepares the festivities, a health committee, commission or committee. The US grants power to the athletic. The athletic, once they are appointed by the community, they exercise a specific authority of their position in a legitimate and a true way. An example of this was when in 1967, an authority from the state capital arrived to the Amador area in the Lacandona jungle. The community members and their authorities from more than 40 different towns were gathered there fighting for the legal tenure of their lands. An official from the Secretariat of Agrarian Reform came in a plane and he had a very arrogant attitude. He said, now I'm here to deal with you about your agrarian issues, but under some conditions. Immediately, one of the leaders of the Amador community said, look, sir, here we want to tell you that we are the authority representing the 40 communities that are present here. The agrarian law states in its article number 14 that the maximum authority of a certain community is its assembly, and we are the assembly of over 40 communities. Therefore, you are speaking with the authority of the Amador region of many communities in the Lacandana jungle. So the only issue to discuss here is that you give us our documents of the presidential resolution for the community, for the 40 communities that are present here today. This event was a fact that shows the awareness of community, the consciousness of community authority and the exercise of their ability. They put into action the defense of their own rights to own their land legally after having fought for many years to conquer this and to obtain this. This is an example of how the athletic are governed in or govern in compliance with the interests of their communities, obeying their own mandate. In a similar way as which our brothers and sisters they work the land, they always have a harvest. What is the harvest? Or what are some elements of the harvest? of what we have been talking about in this session. In this session, we have opened up our spirits to the cultural awareness of the community and to the awareness of obeying the community's mandate. The Popol Vuh is a guide, like a book of the, as book of the community, the Chulel, enables us to discover our spirit, our living and communitarian consciousness. Strengthening our true word makes us true listeners of the word, of the word. We are a single, vital heart creating the power of the community that is obeyed from the beginning of the origins of life and in the actions that give orientation to transformation. Uh, 
crear un reconocimiento. Today we want to acknowledge a group of women, a group of indigenous, Celital and Guatemaltecan women who got together in 1996 to carry out an event related to this cosmogony of indigenous women. It was a woman, a Guatemaltecan priest, woman priest, and other Catholics from Chiapas, others from Oaxaca came. And we want to tell you about this. Here we're going to read a poem, a poem that reflects everything that was harvested from this meeting. It's called Indigenous Women, Women's Worldview. In 1996, this was held in Oaxaca. The photo that you can see here was when they, when they received the sunrise in the site. We were there before sunrise. So we could be there when the sun came up. We participated in this moment of feeling and being and feeling the union with earth and the cosmos, which is so strong in the indigenous peoples. Worldview. Now we're going to show you a presentation of this poem. Corazón del cielo, corazón de la tierra. Esta es la revelación. Las plegarias y las luchas centenarias han sido escuchadas y atraen como noche, como sol y como lluvia a nuestros nichimal metik, nichimal tatik. Flores Madres Nuestros, quienes acariciándonos con voz de viento y humo, nos dicen. Les damos la palabra. Con ella hagan suya la dignidad que fecunde la historia. Recreen los símbolos. Extiendan la confianza. Purifiquen el pensamiento. Hagan un lenguaje nuevo que articule corazones y pueblos, haciendo tejidos multiformes de acuerdos y consensos comunitarios. Les damos la tierra para que con su trabajo cariñoso con la naturaleza se genere la abundancia de vida, para que celebren conciertos entre el pájaro, la computadora y el pez, para que se comunique la vida entre el tigre, la luz y la cascada y se reordene la energía entre el satélite, el prado y la roca. Les damos el poder. Pueden soñar con el sol para que haya libertad en los corazones, para que la liberación venga desde el pobre, desde la mujer, consejera, tierra, sabiduría, ternura y fruto de paz y equidad. Les damos el nuevo cosmos. Pueden abrazar las estrellas y hablar con el ruiseñor y la planta. Les damos la danza nueva y la nueva melodía para que construyan una armonía donde quepan todas, todos y todo. Y la alegría vivirá para siempre en sus corazones. Les damos todo. Corazón de la Tierra. Corazón del Cielo. Well, this has been our presentation for today.